So, the moral agent sounds very prescriptive, doesn't it? And it's a bit Steve Jobs, so which I feel, which I feel very, very You're bad right. about You're whenever right. I mention that. So, yes. And you may feel free to beat me up <laughs> at any time about talking about this. But this, this actually comes down to the idea of trying to maintain some consistency through a system, some consistency of approach. And this is a successful uh, approach to things. We're not prescriptive. You know, this is not Apple. We're not going to ban you if you have wobbly breasts on your iPhone app. This is not going to happen. However, if you want us to help you and you want us to be involved in that whole process, it's kind of important that we agree with what's going on. So I'm going to be trying to be as clear as possible about the things that we like and don't like and give you the opportunity to go, I don't, I, don't, you know, I don't agree with that right now, rather than you spending a month writing something fantastic that we think is so immoral that we're never going to include in our source tree, So, which, would, which is fine. You're, you can go do that stuff, but it's just whether or not you're expecting any kind of support from us in that thing. So. So, what we don't care about, and this is actually, it's a small slide, but it covers an awful lot of things. It covers quite a lot of things that usually software people do care about in software projects, but we don't. And we don't care about them because Jim doesn't care about them. And if Jim doesn't care about them, then, well, it's very hard for me to care about them. So, um, we don't care how you write it. So, we don't have any coding style guidelines, do we, Jim? Not really, no. There's a couple of little idiomatic things that would be quite nice if you followed, I think, in the code, and you've already met those. But hey, you know, if you want to write it in Server Croat, as I said, I, I, we really don't care. So uh, if you can find a weird language and environment to write it in, we also don't really care about that, just as long as it's not proprietary. As long as you write the installers to install Yes, exactly. <laughs> Put it this way, you can, make your, you can make your own horrible world if you wish to do so. so. Um, we don't care what noise it makes. So I do not care if you write an application for playing heavy metal. I don't even care if you write apps for jazz. You know, I really, <laughs> I really. There are limits, John. There are, that's true. There probably are. Yes, there probably are. But I, I actually, genuinely, this is not our business. Make what the sounds you make, and the process by which you want musicians to make those sounds. Um, in terms of the notes they play, that's really not our concern, and I don't have a view on that. In fact, that's at the heart of the creativity of what we're trying to achieve with an open software environment. So, and we don't care what it does. Now, that's a slightly ambiguous statement. We do care about how it does it, but we don't care what the end result is, and that's an important thing to make a distinction about. We don't care whether or not you want to rewrite the sign oscillator 15 times with different names. If there's actually any kind of idea that that might be useful, even if there's not an idea it's useful, and it's just you just wanted to do it in some kind of Dadaist <laughs> seeking of the pointless, um, I'm, we're cool with that. We really, really don't care. But so what, Make a painting program out of the open market. Yeah, cool. Go for it. If you want to have it, paint your house. If you want to control Lego robots, it, all these things are just fine with us. We really don't care. But we do care about how it does it, about how it goes about doing these things. And that's much more significant to us because players of the instruments and users of the software need to form some consistent mental model in their brain about how they interact with it. And it doesn't take many things to be breaking that model for it to become very, very uncomfortable for a user, a player, a musician, whoever might be working with Eigenly. So now we come down to the rather more extensive set of slides of the things we do care about, but they're much more detailed. So this is a very sweeping set of statements here, and it encompasses an awful lot of different activities. So the first thing here, and this is my personal little hobby horse, so you will run up directly against me if we have arguments about this, is don't break bell counter. And by not breaking it, this means that you must provide support for it and everything. It's one of those things. Every action on an agent should be possible from bell counter, should be possible from the language interface. This is even more significant given the rise of voice recognition and artificially intelligent, well, we say intelligent, artificially smart agents to manage things for people. We've seen this in Siri um, with the iOS developments, and I think that's going to be more and more significant. And um, as a result of that promise in the future, I'm very, very keen we don't make it impossible to experiment with that over the next couple of years. Now, that's difficult. GUIs in general become very hard. They're not mutually compatible, naturally mutually compatible models. A linguistic model where you give instructions and commands to things is not the same as clicking on a screen. And some things where you can click on a screen are just way harder in the language model, and some things in the language model are just way harder in clicking on a screen model. We're really trying to keep those two things friendly with each other and compatible with each other. And that, as I say, is just a difficult thing, and you're going to find it difficult. It's also 
sometimes not technically for terribly difficult, it's just boring. You get to the end of your agent, you've got your little GUI thing, and then suddenly you've got to think about these words and commands, and you've got to implement it, and it'll take you a day. And it's one of those things you just think, I'm never going to use that myself, I just won't bother. And all I'm saying here is, as a sort of disciplined component in our environment, we always bother. We always take the trouble. There's a few places, interestingly, that are coming out as we're discussing where we haven't. And we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to fix that. It's very interesting talking about Workbench, for example. The moment you can create agents, you can place them on a canvas. And you can create agents in Belcanto. You can do all that stuff still scripted. But you can't place them on the canvas. And that's something we have to now change and add. Because it would be very nice to be able to do that. Suddenly we realize that's a powerful thing to be able to do, to have a script that builds you something and actually lays it out for you as well and makes some sort of sense out of it. So, so as I say, GUIs in general are hard. And if you start to write anything with a GUI in, it's very, very worthwhile keeping a little lookout from the corner of your eye about just exactly how you're going to then make that all work nicely in Belcanto and play nicely. Um, if we're right, the effort will be worthwhile. Um, I say there's a sort of royal we in there because really I get the blame for this. So I'm quite happy if, if, if it turns out that I'm right that we say we and we can all be right about it, but I'm quite happy as well that if it turns out in three years to be the dumbest thing that we did. Um, I will probably have a lynching party coming around composed of Jim and Kurt and Al and Joe and Aaron and all the people, in fact, you, all the people in this room as well, will come around and probably tar and feather me because it's a lot of work to keep that sort of objective in sight at the moment and it's not one that's hugely rewarding at the moment. Um, if you disagree with this, that's okay. You can write things that don't follow these rules, but we're not really going to be that interested in in working with that. So we're not going to be particularly interested in merging into the core source tree and we're not going to be particularly interested in, um, in contributing to the effort of developing that sort of stuff. So, um, so by all means go off, do things that don't have this kind of compatibility. But as I say, uh, you kind of have to count us out of that effort in doing that. So I'm not going to get upset about it. So it's one of those things. What about adding to the that's fine. I'm the lexicon god. You just have to talk to me. There's a region in the lexicon, and it's a, a region in flux. Some of you have already met it. Uh, I think you have um, both met that, haven't you, in adding the word um, wavetable. Um, there's a section which starts with 8.8, eight, uh, where you can just randomly add words. Uh, that doesn't guarantee they're going to remain either there. They don't stay there. They get sorted at some point. So once in a while I have a big sort out and I move all the words around in the lexicon. And what I try to do is to solicit opinion and look at the way they're actually played on the instrument to make them not uncomfortable. But if we need to create an agent uh, to do yeah. this whole thing, I need to yeah. add a term. You're going to need to add terms, but what happens then is there's a dialogue with me at some point which will be about where it goes, whether it's a good use of the word. I mean these things are actually, once you've done the work, changing the words is trivial. You know, it's very, very easy in the source file. So it's not a conversation that's ever going to be particularly emotive because really who cares? It's, it's just got to be right. Into the agent where the agent can talk to the lexicon yes. to add itself in or something. You know, where you uh, no, the lexicon's static at the moment. There isn't a technical way you could do that. You actually have to check it out, the source code tree, and add it. And then I think we'll, 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 we'll think of a way to... Yeah, I was going to say, because yeah. otherwise yeah. you're going to yeah. be... When we're creating, you know, 200 agents for you, kind of thing, yeah. you're going to be busy. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's busy. You'll add them, and then I'll argue with you about them. And if I don't argue with you because I'm too busy, then, hey, that's great, right? You know, <laughs> there's no argument, you know? <laughs> and it all sits there in that temporary region anyway, which is really awkward to type. So there's a lot of incentive to move it. And it's only, I only argue with developers when I move it out of that region. So that's the point. I go, did you really need the word slarty about fast for a sample, you know? You, you, could you not have used, you know, and then they go, yes, yeah, well, I could have done it. Right, deleting that word, just go and change it in the Python to do that. So, and it, it's, it's generally, it's, a, it's actually not a process that's caused much trouble up to now. Uh, I don't think it's likely to cause one in the future. But if you do need to add a word, you can add it in there. If you want it, and if you don't have a Git checkout and you want it added into the core lexicon in that temporary region, just write us an email and we'll stuff it in there for you so it will be in the next release. So... Um, and this is my last point. This is probably the single most awkward thing in finishing an agent. It's quite often the last thing you get round to is making all the bell canto call. And it's just an extra half day stuck on the end of things. And it's a bit like writing the documentation. You know, we just, you don't want to do it. You know, it's one of those things. You know, but you have to do it. It's just one of those things. It's you know, not like writing the documentation, actually. You do have to do this one because if you want to make an agent that fits in the whole world, it's just sort of a thing you have to have. So, what we care about, number two, is MIDI. 
And MIDI is a disaster in our world. We interface with it and we work with it and we do a lot of awkward, clever stuff to try and get in and out of MIDI. But it's not a cool system. Um, it's old, it's really showing its age, and it has, it has some significant problems. And the big thing for you here is to not let MIDI-centric thinking bleed into your agents because it's so, so easy to let that event model from MIDI end up in the stuff you write. You know, it's so easy to start thinking about the beginning of a note having a pitch. And it doesn't have that. It might start with no pitch. There might be no value coming in. It could be unpitched. It could be meaningless to talk about a pitch. There's all sorts of things that come with MIDI-centric thinking. And if you've done a bit of software development in the music world, you'll be absolutely threaded with this, like rock, you know, holiday rock, through and through. You will have some element of MIDI thinking inside you. It's so difficult to get rid of. And I would really, really ask you to put your thinking hats on when you start to code and just try and get rid of it. And as soon as you interface with the outside world, you've got this big impedance mismatch and you have to manage that process. The easy way of managing that process is to allow the MIDI into the middle of Eigendee. And that we're never going to be very happy about because it's just breaking the whole idea. Why would you go to the trouble of writing code so complicated in the event model inside Eigendee and then just putting MIDI on top of it, which makes it incredibly simple and a bit crude and not very good. And good event handling, it's my last point here, is, is hard, but it's worth it because it is really at the heart of the expressive playing of a musical instrument. It's the reason that music today, dance music in particular, is rather dull. You, know, you don't hear the kind of things that we were hearing from Charlie Parker and John Coltrane being played now on electronic instruments. You just don't hear that. It's not because the sounds aren't there. It's because the entire chain of performance is broken. And it gets broken as soon as you go near MIDI. You're never, ever going to overcome that model in MIDI. You can squeeze and flex around it and do this weird channelizing and higher resolution note values and all this stuff. And we have to do all this. It's just the world we live in. But let's try and march towards something better in the future. So really don't let MIDI invade the middle of things. You know, it's okay at the boundaries of the system, but you really need to keep in your mind that writing MIDI kind of agents is, well, go and write a VST. You know, there's a million hosts for that stuff, and why would you even bother in encountering the sort of difficulties of D? without the payoff. And this is probably the most profound thing of all, really, which is that some of the greatest creative moments in music come from the abuse of technology, of doing new things that were never thought of when people created the technology. And this is a really big, strong personal point for me. The electric guitar would never have made heavy metal music if it had been written by a software engineer there wouldn't be a way to distort the amplifier because the software engineer would have thought, distortion, that is wrong. We will not do that. You know, boom. And therefore, we wouldn't be distorting electric guitars. Think of the amount of music that's been made with distorted electric guitars over the last 40 years and, you know, how much fun, interesting, great music's been made in that way. And that's my real point about that. This is really challenging, again, as a software developer because one of the ways that we make code reliable and make it usable as we restrict people's options to the things that we really know they want to do. And then we very carefully manage those inputs, because inputs are the thing that really do for you in software. They're the things that produce the wild internal states. They're the things that produce the strange time. They're all of those corner cases that really get you as a developer. And in our world, we have to let people do that stuff. We really have to let people do that stuff. And it's so, so, so tempting at any point in time in software to fall into that good engineering practice of not permitting that. And it is good engineering practice, we're just not allowed it. Because we're dealing with musicians, we're not dealing with people flying airplanes, you know, we're not dealing with people flying space shuttles, we're not dealing with people writing letters or managing finances, we're dealing with people who want to do something mad, new and creative. And that's a whole, whole different objective for software. It's quite a rare one, not many people write software that actually does that stuff. So you have to let the musician abuse your code. They're going to put things into it. They're going to make it behave in bad ways. And that's OK. That's actually genuinely OK. So many great things have come from that in the past that it's genuinely a good thing to encourage. So, and I say, I'm sort of emphasizing my point here. Really, if there's a decision to make about anything, and you can give that decision to the musician instead of making it yourself, let them have that decision. Yes, they can make a bad call then. They can do something that turns the system into a glitch nightmare, or they can so, and that might be really cool. You just don't know. And because we don't know, it's very arrogant of us to make any kind of decisions about it. And we still find ourselves, although I repeat this mantra periodically, and it's sort of embedded in Eigen Labs to a certain extent now, we still find ourselves falling into the good engineering practices. 
It sounds like a weird thing to talk about good engineering practices as a bad thing, but in software engineering and creative software engineering, they are genuinely bad. Flip side of that, of course, is this is very hard because of the last statement here, which is don't crash. You can do bad things, but you can't stop the system running. And that's the big, this is the challenging part of that whole statement, which is that it's really, really hard to write software that allows people to do bonkers stuff and doesn't crash. So that's the one thing you've got to do. You, you can allow all sorts of inputs to create mad outputs. You can do all these things, but you really are not constrained the player. But what you can't do is, you know, malloc 18 gigabytes of memory and just hope that that's going to be okay because the musician wanted it. That thing, we have to protect them against. So we have to protect them against the airplane falling out of the sky, but we don't have to protect them against doing the loop, the loop, the 747. You know, that's, that's where we're at, really, with this stuff. And it's, once again, it's quite a challenging. When you actually start to work with it, you find yourself just falling into the habits of, no, the user shouldn't get a set of frequency, which is, is beyond audible. People shouldn't make an oscillator, be able to make an oscillator to blow all their tweeters up. Well, you know, that's not crashing, right? It just blows all the tweeters up. They're an idiot. But that's not our job. Making people not idiots is not our job. It might just turn out that, you know, there's a music for bats movement, right? So, you know, and we should just go, okay, you know. Once again, you have to go on the... It's not what you imagine might be possible. It's just thinking, I don't know. As soon as you don't know, just l let someone else worry about it. There's just so many in that sort of creative tree. There are so many possibilities that you just don't want to put any restraints in. You know, that aren't appropriate. It does make our system feel quite hostile to people who are now used to um, software that is incredibly constrained and just does the one thing really well. We're not about that. We're about a whole different thing and it's going to be hostile in the same way that a guitar. If you have an electric guitar and you have a 4x12 Marshall stack on your head and you turn it up to 11, that's not a friendly thing. That's so incredibly noisy. You touch it, you twitch, you speak near it and it goes off. So this is, but the, what a creative tool. What a fantastic creative tool. And that's what we have to be thinking about. In the very potential the chaos and disaster also lies the potential for these magic moments, and we have to allow that to happen. So, so that's me ranting on away about, about um, that sort of stuff. So, Oh, there's a fourth one. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Sounds very prescriptive, doesn't it? Once again, I'm going to say about all this stuff. You don't have to do any of this. You can go off and do your own stuff. This is what we care about. This is the stuff that we're going to be looking at when we merge stuff into our trees. It's what we care about when we're giving the experience that we really want musicians to have with EigenHarps and EigenD. You can go and write agents that don't do any of this stuff. You'll probably be quite popular if you write stuff that doesn't crash and doesn't break and does, you know, it's very friendly for people who, who don't want to be that creative. But this is the stuff we care about. This is the last point, really. And this is one of the more difficult things, again, to think about is musicians aren't programmers. You know, they don't think about that stuff like that. And we're all programmers and musicians in this room, apart from Antonio. And it's, it's significant that a mindset can set in this stuff that's very, very technical. And it really thinks about the, sort of these problems in a, in, a, in a way that's not appropriate for the, for the eventual person that's got to use it. So and musicians don't think like programmers. You know, it's very interesting talking to you, Stephen. You, you, you mentioned having something that compiles stuff. And as soon as they hear the word compile, you know, even as a developer, I hate compilers. You know, musicians, they, don't, they, they wouldn't even understand what that was. You know, they, they, they have no grasp of. And more profoundly, not only do they not understand it, they're completely uninterested in gaining the understanding of it. So it's not even a process where you can educate or lead people in discovery of. It's one of those things they just don't, they don't care about. You know, it's just not what they're about. So, uh, and it's worth keeping that in mind whenever you write something. You know, it's sometimes the thing you think is really cool just isn't for everybody else, you know, so, which is okay, but once again, you know, it's worth keeping that in the front of your mind. And I don't, I'm a, I'm a programmer, and when I play, I don't think like a programmer. I don't want to think in that way. I don't want to think technically. I don't want to even think about wires. For me, you know, I, I'm trying to get away from all that stuff, and part of our mission is to make that as possible as, as we can. I don't think we're doing very well at the moment. I think, don't think music software in general is doing particularly well with that. Um, but it has to be something sitting there in the distant future as a thing to be aspired to. So. And once again, remember these three stages of music, because if we're ever having conversations about the way things work, we're always going to come back to this mental model of about how people work. You've got private rehearsal, and in that, GUI's a call. Now, that's, that's workbench territory. That's when you're noodling around, setting things up, getting it so it's going to work for you, building your tool as a musician. 
Um, and fiddly is okay too. I don't, it doesn't matter in that situation. It takes you an hour to get a sound right. It's quite common for it to take you a whole hour to get a sound really perfect. But then you have public rehearsal, and public rehearsal is working with your friends, is when you're in a room, when, you, you know, when you're actually, you're on. You're not, you're not on to the point where you can't make mistakes, but you're actually also not able to go away for 20 minutes and do something. You know, if you do that three times in a rehearsal, you're not going to be liked by your band members. In that situation, GUIs are okay, but fiddly is bad. Now that's the point at which most AU interfaces aren't very cool. They're, they're GUIs, you know, they're all pointy clicky things with not, they're, they're just not very good for that sort of stuff. This is the kind of environment where stage really sort of, sort of comes into its own and that's the, that's the way to think about that is that at that point you need graphical interfaces that are trivial. You know, if you really want people to use them effectively and that's where you're choosing your samples or you might change a few things and tweak a few bits and pieces but you're unlikely to be spending six and a half hours exploring a new Omnisphere patch, you know. So you probably, well, you might be doing that in a public rehearsal but as I say, you, you probably are killed by your um, fellow musicians. And the last element is performance. And that point, I think GUIs are the dullest thing on the planet. Then they're really, you know, if you're depending on a graphical user interface on a screen for a public performance, then I think you've made an error. Uh, I don't know how else to put that. I just, uh, it's not my cup of tea. And the last thing is, this is really probably encapsulates all of that thing. Is just keep it friendly. It doesn't need to be simple. It doesn't need to be dumb just wants to be friendly to people. This is why we have dangly wires and workbench instead of little schematic things. You know, we try to keep it so that people feel a little bit more at home with it than they would do with something that feels very technical. All software is deeply technical under the hood. And some companies, and I think as I say, Apple have made a, a very, very profitable and very good um, business of this, have managed to hide a lot of their technicality. But they've done it by making a very extreme assumption, which is that people are as dumb as a box of rocks and actually can't grapple with anything complicated. So they legislate that people can't think, which is, in my opinion, is a step too far. We've just really got to keep it in mind that if we write something that has the name Fourier Transform as part of its vocabulary, we've kind of made a mistake. So I think that's probably a way of illustrating it. You know, we have to keep in mind that you know, we have to think of a nicer, fluffier word for Fourier Transform. If that's what we mean, we still have to find something that, you know, that the average person playing the cello might actually understand. So. Does anybody want to comment on any of this? Because it sounds like quite a lot of prescriptive weirdness. So does anybody disagree with anything I've got to say about it? Or, no? Maybe exactly, exactly about the GUI stuff. Why is it? I mean, I understand if you mm -hmm. have this, you have every agent has to have not be reliant on Good, GUI. Good, yeah. But in general, it's not bad to have GUI. No, for stage, going back a slide, for this point here, for the private rehearsal point, they're very cool. We made a mistake in not having enough of this, not having enough graphical tools here, because there's some things that are so much more comfortable in a graphical control environment than they are in any kind of visceral environment from an instrument. But the problem you've got is that if you have a GUI and suddenly it's easier to use, people will use it here. The moment they use it here, I have spent a lot of my life on stage with people staring at computer screens. And it is the dullest, most boring, worst, worthless performance thing you can possibly be doing. Why? You know, it's like having a cassette machine on stage. You just, you don't look interesting. You can't engage with your audience. There's all sorts of human stuff that just disappears. Well, that's the problem of the performer, the musician. Yeah, but it's I mean, our problem to give them the tools. The, what yep. you want to say probably is that you have to give the musician the choice not to use a GUI. Yes, but I also am on a religious mission, which is that I want people to make that choice. I don't want to force them, but I want to encourage them. So for me, the balance is quite simple. If the GUI is there, if it's so much easier to use than the alternative, because we built it that way, and actually you can always build it one way or the other. If it's so much, people will use the GUI. If you make an interface to EigenD tomorrow that's like Ableton, people will pile in and start using it because it will be like Ableton, it'll be very comfortable, you know, they're used to using that kind of screeny, patchy sort of things coming. That will be, that's possible, but it would be a mistake because it would basically mean that the other part of our system would wither and die because things also, it's political, things follow trends, you know, people want to work on the thing that everyone's using, all that kind of stuff. So it's a more complex and nuanced picture than just giving people choice because when you give people choice, you also give them the good choice and the bad choice. And that's often about where you put the effort in. 
if you put the effort in the bad choice, you know, which would be the GUI on stage in this, we're defining the GUI on stage as the bad choice in this situation. Uh, and that's an arbitrary definition, but it's also a definition that makes us unique because lots of people don't have that definition. Why would you work in this environment if you want that? There are way better GUI on stage applications than I can do. You know, they're always going to be better because that's their business, it's what they do. So we're defining that as the bad choice. We're defining it as the good choice for this kind of activity and the bad choice for here. And that's really, it's a matter of definition. It's not, um, it's not one of, you know, there's no, there's no hard and fast okay, fact it's about this. Then. It is, and it's basically one that's, that's like that. But you do have a choice when you make things about which one you make, you know, where you spend your effort. Do you sweat to make something so that people can work it without a GUI? Do you really do the effort, make the effort to do that? And it's usually quite hard to do that. Graphical interfaces are now, you know, they're, they're the easy one of choice because the tools are great. There's tons of stuff, you know, it's very well understood. There are all sorts of reasons the graphical interfaces are very seductive for programmers now, and other interfaces really aren't. That's uh, because if you don't have a graphical interface, your tool chain suddenly evaporates to a tiny m number of things, and the th mental process of thinking about it gets much more difficult. You know, if you're thinking about a man running, controlling your application across stage while he's headbanging, that's a whole different thing to think of a man going, you know. It's just not the same. You've got to think about it in a whole different kind of way, and, and it, it matters. That, that, that that's the case in, in Eigenhart land. It doesn't matter in other applications. They're built for people to be seated when they use them. You know, they're built for people not to look that interesting, in fact, on stage. But our mission, if you like, is to solve that problem. Our mission is to make bring that to people that actually want to, to be show people on stage. They want to do. You see an awful lot at the moment uh, in sort of the very top end of performance people putting huge effort into stage shows but they're not playing their instruments. You know, you're not seeing what you see with Pink Floyd. You don't, you don't get to go and see somebody playing a piece of music that you love, actually playing it. You, don't, you, don't, you, see, you go and see the thing you heard on the record because they've re-recorded they pre it or it's sequenced or it's in a patch or it's in, a, you know, it's in something like that. And this, this is something I, I do care about personally. It's one of the main reasons for all of this effort is to, is to, is to stop that happening. So, so I have no, no objection to goodies, but I think they have their place I don't think their place is in front of an audience, ever. Yeah, actually one thing I like about live to say is that I don't need to use the GUI because mm. you can put everything on MIDI and I think what, what, what this yeah. is, is, it's more or less, if you start something, you, you rely, Emacs for instance now mm. has a GUI, but if you start to really do something with Emacs, you start to do the key presses yes. because this is that what's going fast. It's yes. not using the mouse, going somewhere yeah. and doing. So I think it's more like the GUI. It's it's the thing you, you you start learning with also to see everything, and then when you are comfortable with, you just want to have this, you know. That's true, but the number of musicians I've seen on stage running Ableton that haven't had to walk over to their laptop and use it is actually zero. They probably are musicians who are using Ableton. It's possible to do it. And actually, it's got some quite nice stuff to be able to use it without looking at the screen. But their focus is here. Their focus is imagining that in this space here, this mental space here of performance, it's OK to be doing these things. My focus and the focus of this company and the focus of Eigendy and all of our developments, what we're about, is that that's not OK here. We should be enabling people to not be doing that here. We should actually be more than just enabling, and this is where the difference comes in in our discussion, we should be encouraging them. By, and the way we encourage them is making it better. What about something like the console mixer on the, on the alpha? Yeah. I mean, you can do, you can, I mean, you don't need stage sitting in front of you to change yeah. your levels or something like that. But there's, no, there's very little feedback when you change the numbers. Well, that's the reason we developed stage as a networked application. You can Velcro the back of your iPhone or your iPod Touch, hopefully your Android device in the future, and stick it to yourself, to your instrument. And that's like the volume control on your guitar then. It's just a thing. I know a volume control on guitar is a graphical interface to something, right? Stage yeah. does not count as a GUI. Well, no, because actually it's a very restricted set of things. And actually, you don't really want to, what you don't want to be doing, this is, this is where it's subtly, what you don't want to be doing is doing the computer thing. You don't want to be sitting so there. You don't want to, if you think of playing, if you think somebody has to take their eye off that great looking girl in the middle of the audience, right? If they have to take their eye off that girl for more than five seconds for any operation while they're playing, we've, we've failed. 
Because that, that magnetism that you get, that kind of thing you get when you've got an audience, big audience in front of you and you're working, the, you know, and you're, you're playing, you know, we, we, you know that, is, that is the core of one of the performance elements of being a musician, a great musician, is to be able to engage, personally engage with people in an audience. Great players, the really good guys, can do this to huge crowds by picking people and working the crowd. You just watch them. You watch that guy from, um, oh, he used to be in Nirvana. What's his name? Foo Fighters, man. Yeah, you watch him work in a crowd. He's amazing. You just watch that happening. The eye contact, the way he's working with the crowd, the conversations that he'll get going backwards and forwards. It's fantastic. That is what we want to enable. He's a guitar. He plays guitar. You know, can you imagine him with a laptop on stage? He couldn't even do that. If he even had a screen on him that he had to interact with every minute, it, it wouldn't. He'd be losing the plot with that. So there is a kind of. It's a spectrum. There is no, there's no kind of cliff that you fall over here. It's a spectrum. And our mission has got to be to enable people to be on the guitar end of that spectrum, not on the laptop DJ end of that spectrum. The laptop DJ has a place in music, a very strong place these days, and it's a very important part of music. But, and it's so well catered for. This is the other thing about it, is that we don't want to go and compete. Why would, why would all of us in the this room go and try and compete with the guys working on Ableton. I mean, these people know their world so well, and the software is actually still bulletproof and works really well. And yes, you can think of little improvements you can make to it, but hey, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty much like a Rolls-Royce product already. It's just not, that is not an area in software development for music performance that's ill-served. This space, where you don't want to look at a computer screen while you're playing, that's very ill-served. Very, very. Ableton doesn't just not do it that well. It's, it's good in some ways. You can do stuff with it and you can, you can wring it dry of stuff. But it's not what you'd think of as a natural tool for this. And we're trying to make a natural tool for that. Sorry? Just don't read the manual and don't have any idea how it should work. Then you can hmm. make it work. But it's you can. Stuff. But, yeah. but, you're, but you're, you're fighting something that's, you're fighting yeah. something that's developed to actually sit in front of. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah. you're, you're not working with something whose reason for existence is that. So that's the... You don't have to fight it. No, but I, I think it's... A, uh, I, I, I'm with you there. Hmm. And I think if you... What, what you should clarify maybe is... Uh, so as I have understand it, understood it, um, GUI for you is something I have to look at to, to make it work. So that's what you don't want. A GUI involves pointing and clicking. Yeah, okay. looking, if you have to at stuff. Exactly. If you, ha if you want to get where I'm coming from, if you have to take your eye off that, once again, just think of being on stage, a whole load of people. You know, if you have to take your eye off that audience member, we'll go gender neutral because we're going to be politically correct for 10 seconds of my talk. Um, if you have to take your eye off that person in the audience for more than five seconds, yeah. how long does it take for a guitarist to adjust the volume? You know, they can usually quite often do it by even looking. You know, that's a GUI. That is a, that little knob is a graphical user interface. You can see it. It's got numbers on it. You can see where you're turning it to. But it's one of those things people can just. And stage is a similar thing. You can just, you can control stuff and you can just look away. But if you're trying to do something a bit more complicated, you know, if you're trying to change the tuning of your guitar, you're going to be looking at. That's not cool. There's great systems on the guitars where you can push a button and change the tuning. Now that for a performer is just awesome. That's where we're headed. You know, that's where we want to be. We want to be where you don't have to lose contact with the audience at any point. So now I see why you want the voice interface. It's all become clear. Right. Because you want to eyeball the girl and uh, say, yeah. baby, and have it. Isabel's not here. We can talk like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's running off the argument. Yeah, well, Mar 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 Monty, who's the mechanical designer, he's away traveling around the world at the moment, but he actually <laughs> always wanted his telephone number scrolling up <laughs> the air. Uh, <laughs> You know, hence the HTTP server yeah. that we would love for. Text, <laughs> text messaging. Text messaging, yeah, that pops up. There's all sorts of cool stuff we can do. But my point is not, I'm not talking about a technical, a technical thing here. I'm talking about a visceral human thing when you're actually performing. And the danger is, as developers, is that we do something that's so great. This is the trouble, you know. You go away, you have a great idea. But then we don't figure out the bit about how to do it without losing eye contact with the audience in this mode of performance. We don't provide tools in here that make it not just possible, but the com most comfortable way, because we've spent the most time in it. Most things in software that, that are the most comfortable, the things that developers spent the most time doing, and they really thought about how they wanted to do it. So if you want to be here staring at a laptop screen, I have to encourage you to go away and write VSTs for Ableton, because 
it, this is, it, it's the wrong space to be thinking that we're going to put laptop screens on, on stage. It's just not Actually, our... It, uh, stage is not agreed. And, uh, we're talking about different things. Okay, cool. So I about no, no, you're thinking of the technical term of a graphical user interface. When I think about it, I think about how people actually look when they use it. And they don't look like musicians to me. They still don't. Now, it's not just me being an old git. I just think that sat in front of something... You know, yes, sat... Pianists, the only other people who suffer from the same problem, they big, lumpy bump of wood, you know. And they have to get a keytar, you know, if they really want to look good. But this is, why are all bands fronted by guitar players? We have to think about it. Why are they fronted by saxophonists, guitar? They're fronted by people who can pick their instrument up, look the audience in the eye while they play, and, and walk around on stage. Most bands aren't fronted by the drummer. If they are fronted by the drummer, the audience looks at the, looks at the guitar players. Or the backing singers, girls, you know... The bass player, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's, 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 yeah, I mean, it, if you're a great drummer it's, and want to start your own band, you're never going to get the kudos, are you? Do you know what I mean? You're going to be the guy at the back, you know. And it's the same with the keyboards. There have been bands that have been founded by keyboard players. People don't really look at the keyboard player. They look at the trumpet player and the jazz or the sax player or whatever. So it's, it is a very... Humans are, are not smart about this stuff. You know, we're very emotional when we listen to music and when we play it as well. We're not functioning with our reasoning minds all the time. And this is really about that. It's about the fact that I don't think... I think much software in this space has been written by great engineers. And I think it's been written by people as well who are in the DJ world. And I was quite heavily involved in that in the 90s in my recording studios. I made loads of records for DJs, you know, including some of the, what are now considered to be greats in that space. So I understand it very, very well. It's just not the world... It's, and that, that world has become very, very well served, as I said, about, with software. You know, I mean, people have gone and engineered very well for that. But the poor guy who plays the guitar and wants to play electronic sounds has not been to this date, and that's our mission. So, anyway, I think I'm rambling on and on and on about this, and I'm not sure it's entirely useful. But I think we could perhaps discuss this a little further as well as we go through the day. So, yeah. I think it's, in, it's an interesting subject, and it's one that's it's, it's sort of the philosophical root of a lot of the activities we do. Sometimes when we do quite odd things, that will be the reason, at the root of it, will be these reasons that I've run through now. So. In which of those um, three states do you ma uh, mainly see uh, Canton in the performance stage also? I see you writing phrases and building talkers. I see, well, I see Belcanto in the last one. I see Belcanto all the way threaded all the way through that, but used in very different ways. And we never really understood the power of talkers until our musicians taught us the power of talkers because suddenly they had this control over the system they'd never really had before and they just used it like mad. Jim wrote this little thing and off they went. I mean, didn't you get the, the one thing about abuse? Um, you know, when we were kind of coming up to the, to the first releases, the actual current factory setups are the of severe musician abuse, which is one of the reasons they take so long to load. Oh, there's such insane stuff in the 1.4 sections. Because they did things actually that we'd never thought. When they, when they came to kind of build the setups, they did things we'd never thought of doing. And they tortured the system into doing it. There are crazy things that are like, uh, like uh, three key groups running in parallel, but when you push one button, they all switch simultaneously, and there's no software support for that at all. It's just this system that, mirac just as a consequence, accidentally of having all three of them, they just discovered they could do that. Suddenly they did it everywhere because it gives you cool things, gives you multiple signal routing. If they'd have gone back to Jim and said, we'd really like to multiply root signals, we'd have modified key groups to do that, and it probably wouldn't have taken more than a couple of days, but instead they just quietly went and beetled and built this enormous setup, by which point we were like a week away from launch and it was too soon, to, you know, too late to fix. So, Hearing so, a little bit more about that at some point might be interesting. Yeah, no, it's... The, 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 yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the changes, you know, the big changes we're making in 2.0 mm -hmm. to, to rectify... Yeah. Well, so they make those things possible uh, in a much yeah, more efficient make, way. Yeah. So musicians, don't, they just don't think in the same way as programmers. They will, they will go... It's we actually I have to be careful what I say because we have an actual <laughs> few musicians sitting there looking at me occasionally, you know, <laughs> keeping, keeping me on the straight and narrow. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a tricky trap to fall into. I said, yeah. I sit often on both fences because I really, yeah. when I play music and I'm on stage, I love the experience mm. and I absolutely hate having to worry about anything technical. Yeah. But we often have discussions about this where I. But yeah, but you've, you've jumped, you've jumped over the, yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm, I'm being then, the person. And then he says, but no, you're never going to use it like that. Yeah, you're right. It's so, it's so easy to actually. It's easy to fall into. fall into it. Yeah. yeah I've, and, been, I've been a bit quiet, but uh, I even go further. 
I prefer to hide the computer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. One hundred percent. Absolutely. No I screen. Yeah. I hide it from the the eight year old kid. Yeah. There's no, doesn't has to know I have a computer running. Yeah. I hide it from the 14 year old, from the 80 yeah. year old person. He doesn't have to know I'm performing good with a mm. PC, a Mac, whatever. I have to, he has to look at me and what I'm doing, how I'm creating for him in that yes. specific First moment. Yes. Uh, so I go even further than to hide the, the computer. Yeah. And there's a very interesting uh, point as well about stage here, which is that it stands at the moment, stage is full of quite simple widgets that you can use with a finger, you know, and they're, they're, you can make them big and they're dumb. You know, they just twiddle values, basically. There's been quite a lot of talk that we've had, and I'm realizing as I'm, we're having this discussion that some of these things that we've been talking about, perhaps doing stage, are probably wrong. Because actually, if we've been talking about adding more complex widgets that allow you to do some quite swizzy stuff. Actually, that's probably a mistake. That stuff should live in workbench. Okay. You know, and not live in stage because it's about these three stages that yeah, we're talking about. The tension there, though, is we do want to release that you know doesn't have workbench. So if something is something core is built into workbench. Yeah, but we have to be careful about that. Yeah. Thinking about these things yeah. because it could be a quite a creeping kind of you know thing. And I, I want it to stay like the kind of knobs on the guitar. I want to say something you can reach out and just do in performance and not have to think because as soon as you go. And if you get a mouse, you're always going, you know, as soon as you do that thing where you take the attention away, more than five seconds, just always keep that in mind. If it's more than five seconds, the pretty girl has turned away and gone to the bar, and your breeding opportunities have declined, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and when you're 22 years old and you're a musician, this is very important to you. So we have to keep that in our minds, you know? So. Jim, sorry. Well, do you think of, I mean, talkers and controllers, if you like, are... I mean, the levels of GUI there, with Workbench being the most complicated stage somewhere in the middle. Talkers and controllers are the last and dumbest stage of GUI. They're the, one, they're the GUIs, that's the GUI that you stick on the actual instrument, they're your guitar knobs. Bel Canto is what makes that possible, which is kind of why it's key to do everything, because then you can actually build the final stage of GUI using Bel Canto operations. You know, it may be that you're, you're only doing simple things like turn this value up and down, but talkers and controllers are what let you do that. And, I mean, we want to make those as, you know, as good as we can. The more we can improve them, any ideas for improved controllers? Are, are yeah, I mean, good. I think the thing that I was pointing out earlier again is just that the, the feedback on the instrument sometimes is not sufficient. Yeah, no, no, so so fact, I mean, if you've got stage and you can see the levels, yeah, if you not, find that. If you're using stage yeah. to as a feedback you, mechanism, if you, have a, if you have a controller controlling the values, and you've got yeah. stage with just the knobs, then if you use the controller, oh, the, the knobs move from the stage. You yep. use stage as a feedback. feedback. Yeah. So the more we can build into the from the more we can build into the controller. There are things like possibly you know, using strip controllers along with the yeah. controls. So you can, like, Hold the key and touch the strip to. That stuff, yeah, yeah. would all be good. Yeah. And, um, and I think the other thing is that you know, we're making this stuff up as we go along. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of the, this isn't this isn't a known problem space. You know, we're doing it. So when you do this stuff, you do have to engage your imagination. <coughs> this is a very good point here. Is that all this stuff is its new territory, and it's actually kind of cool. You wrote yesterday in with noise oscillator. Noise How long did that take you guys? First bit of code you cut, right? Hour and a half. Yeah, an hour, hour and a half, yeah. yeah. So isn't that fantastic that you can do something that people will love in such a short period of time? So there are all these opportunities to do really cool things as well, very short periods of time. And we are making it up as we go along. We really don't know some of the things that are going to work or not. But we have understood, we have understood these things. You know, we have understood this about it. We've had so many lines of development where you, know, you spend a long time doing something and you put it in front of a position and then you just throw it away. So yeah. Again, different. Yeah. And they just, you know, they don't behave in the way you expect. So we, these are the things that we've understood from our eight years of, nine years now of working on this system. And they, sorry? Ten. Ten. I don't, I just honestly, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I don't like to think about that. So anyway, that's enough about the kind of things that constrain us in our world, if you like. So, and as I say, when you think GUI, Stephen, all you need to think about is that five seconds. And if you can think of it in those terms, you can write the fanciest GUI on the planet, and I'll, I'll love it. If you can use it in five seconds while you're not looking at it, I, I, I'm all no, for it. It's not. My yeah. problem was that yeah. you were talking about the strings. 
Richter. You say you don't want any GUI, then it's a restraint. Oh, it's a restraint, yeah, but there, but there always are restraints in all systems. And this is largely about uh, what we're encouraging people to do rather than what we're forcing them to do. So there's no reason at all you could not be a laptop musician using Eigendy. You know, you can do that. And I think it would be nice to make that possible for people that like to sit and play with laptops. There's a lot of people who perform like that now. I don't think it's very visually stimulating. There's a lot of people who do that. It's not to say we don't do that, but it's not where we're pointed. You know, it's not what we're actually about, and it's not what... It's not that interesting either, because there's great stuff that does that already. Why, why would you reinvent that wheel? But basically, you know? this defines a problem you're solving. Yes, yes exactly. What choose to do. It's what we're choosing to do, exactly. Yeah. It's open source, if you want. Yeah, you can go. Say, we're not telling you. We're not saying you, you can't do this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Go ahead. But it's just, it's not particularly... Uh, if you need it for that, and you, you know what I mean, uh, we know where we're at with that. And I think it'd be interesting to see what comes out of it. Um, Distributing agents, you already know about quite a few of these things, but I thought I'd cover them today so that it was a matter of record as well from the conference. Um, if you sign a contribute <laughs> agreement and are releasing under GPL, we'll probably put it into the core source tree of IGD if it's any good at all. So that will then get distributed with IGD as part of our distribution and it'll be right there on GitHub. So it'd be lovely to see you guys working on some agents in that tree. Uh, it'd be fantastic. And we'll be maintaining it as well. Yeah, we look after it a bit and keep the bills system, you know, all that sort of stuff as well. So it makes your life a little easier if you want to do that. Um, you can also now distribute it or sell it as a binary as well. So you can see we're really trying to make things open about this whole thing. We're not, we're not constraining you to work within GPL version 3. You can write binary agents. You can sell them. You can release them under other MAD licenses if you want. We can't include them in our tree. If you do that, you can do whatever you like. So, and if it starts to, get in, to become interesting activity in the actual sale of agents, you know, buying and selling agents, if you write a great instrument or a great oscillator that does something fantastic, and you want to sell that. If we get a few of those things, then we're, um, we'll, we'll put a marketplace together in our store and actually put a retail environment together for that as well so that people can do it easily. But there's not much point until we've actually got some things to sell. So, so I think it will take a little while. And we're also uh, happy to support any kind of mixed licensing models in that. So if you want to do what we're doing, <laughs> just have part of it GPL or have a lower version GPL and a, and a version with some bells and whistles that you sell, we're cool with that as well. So, you know, people need to eat. I'm not Richard Stallman. People do need to eat. They need to charge things as well. So I love the openness that comes with open source, and I love the participatory nature of it, that we get guys like yourselves in a room that are also contributing and doing interesting stuff. But there's actually no harm at all as well in making a living out of it. So if you do want to do that, go ahead. And we're going to add a credit section to IGND shortly um, for all the developers that have worked on it. There's a fair number of them now over the last 10 years not just including Al and Kurt and Jim in the room. Um, and um, this is a kind of tiny little thing, but if you do contribute significantly at all, we're going to put, we'll put your name in there with us. So it'll be a little bit of kudos. I mean, 